Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dustin DeFelice, and I'm coming here from uh, not quite as beautiful uh, East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, we're turning cold now, so it's uh, definitely a different part of the time of year versus Hawaii. But thank you for inviting me. Um, I've been working with language learning and language teachers for the past 15 years, and I was happy to be a part of this with this focus on theory with community of practice and interaction. So let me start off by talking a little bit about just kind of the theories that I want to overview um, today that give us sort of a foundation for how to work with a community of practice uh, within language learning. I've got three, and there are many more that possibly can interact with this, with this the complexity of what we're talking about today with online learning and communities of practice. But we'll look at the cognitive development theory, um, some behavioral theory, and then social interdependence theory. And I'll talk about some of the highlights of each one of those ideas, and then we'll look into ways of how those things work together. So let me jump in then to cognitive developmental theory, which is often um, grounded in the work of Piaget as well as that of Vygotsky. And in this theory, the idea is that we develop our abilities in language, in life, in experience in general, through a, pro a progressive reorganization of mental processes that come uh, about as the result of two separate ideas, biological maturation and then environmental experience. So I should note that when PJ worked with this idea, he spent most of his time with young children, infants um, to two to three years old. But a lot of his ideas, though they were developed with that age group, have been carried forward into other areas, especially with the work of Vygotsky, which goes from childhood all the way to adulthood. And it's just a focus on how we construct an understanding of the world that's around us based on the experiences we've had before and the discrepancies we find as we experience new things. And this is all being done between what we already know and what we're discovering concurrently. So if I can focus here on three ideas, the first one being, all of this is based on what we already know. So we've got these ideas from our experiences that we use to build on as we experience new things. These are referred to by Piaget as building blocks of knowledge. He called them schema. And we use those pieces then to consistently and constantly construct new experiences as we go through life, as we learn new things, and that includes things that are related to language. And it's important to note that as we go through this process, we're obviously adapting to the things we see in a lot of ways based on the discrepancies we find in the schema we've already developed, and we compare that to the new things we encounter as we move forward. Now, these, both of these ideas talk about the idea that it's cooperation then, working together in a community of practice, for example, leads to sort of a simulated cognitive development, which complements the work done by Vygotsky and the idea that knowledge is socially constructed and this comes about through cooperative efforts for us to learn, to understand, and to solve problems together. So I think it's a nice framework for us to start with, a nice theory um, as we think about how we put together our own language classrooms. The next theory then, and this is one that I think we often don't think of in today's terms, we look at behaviorists behaviorism kind of as a forgotten theory, in, especially in terms of language learning. Though what we're seeing is, in fact, a lot of things we do today are still heavily based in the ideas that was, were, were put forth first by Watson and Skinner and other um, behavioral psychologists. So one thing that is very prevalent, especially with our focus on um, online technologies or technologies in general, is the idea that behavior, behavior can be not only measured, and we're doing this constantly today with uh, including a program like uh, Collaborate where we're monitoring, following along, fo and using things in different ways to monitor or measure our progress. We also can be trained in how to do these things. And in some ways, a lot of this is imitation. We see or we're, we're explained or shown how to do something using a computer or a device or a tablet. And we imitate that behavior in order to get things to work. And obviously, we do this um, as we change, as we find new devices or new technologies or new experiences. And this is all done through what was known as um, conditioning. 
And we see this in the way we interact with technology today. Many of us will take a look at our iPhone, for example, and see an app on our screen. We touch that. It opens that app. We've now been conditioned to know that if we touch that specific spot, it will open up the program we want to use or the app we're looking to, to utilize. Now, we all know that doesn't work um, 100% of the time. So as part of our um, conditioning, we do see that when we do push something, a button, um, a website, a link, and it doesn't work, our conditioning is such that we will push that button again, possibly a third time, and maybe at a fourth time, we might get in there and figure out that we're in, this conditioning is not working before we maneuver into another strategy, possibly turn the device off, go to a different app, etc. And all of this is linked together then through the system of what was called rewards and punishment. So a lot of um, things that we go through in life have rewards as well as punishments. So punishments probably isn't the right word to use today, but the idea being that there are things that influence our behavior to do things in a certain way or to stop doing them in another way. So even though this idea of behaviorism with language learning has fallen to the wayside as we've learned that children are not blank slates, they don't imitate their parents, for example, or their guardians, but we do know that in other realms, especially in structural technology, behaviorism today still plays a major role in our um, understanding of how we interact together. So that brings us then to this idea of social interdependence. And this theory um, started very early on in the 1900s with uh, Kafka and then his student Le uh, Lewin. And they look at the idea of a fact that groups, communities of practice, are in, in the, the whole thing together. We're working towards a similar goal um, and we, we form these groups with these common goals, and oftentimes it may be a goal imposed, it may be a goal we work on together, and it may be a goal we don't even realize that is there. And as we're working together, we're obviously interrelated. So what we do with one person within the community of practice influences the behavior and the outcomes for others. And this essence, this essence of that group interdependence then, is was called a dynamic whole, excuse me. And what that meant then is that any member or any subgroup that does any kind of change within the dynamic of the group itself leads to some kind of change throughout the entire process. And that sort of state of tension within group members then is one type of motivation that leads towards more accomplishments possibly towards that common goal that we're talking about. Before though, I leave these three theories behind, I do want to specifically mention that within second language acquisition then, we do see that most theories posit that input is crucial. The idea that we have to give input for students to learn, to process, and to move forward. Additionally, most of these theories then also apply to or, or discuss ideas like output, interaction, and then negotiation of meaning. And all of those then, in their own way, play roles in the language, the overall language learning process. So looking at these three theories, and then the ideas we already know, based on our research within second language acquisition, we can put together communities where we encourage the use of comprehensible input, we allow for output, we also provide places and spaces for interaction, and the negotiation of meaning. And all of those fall very nicely into play with this social interdependence theory. Okay, um, now of course we're talking about online environments, and these do provide alternatives to learners that are possibly isolated or in need flexible learning arrangements. There is a little bit of lack of valuable face-to-face -face interaction, but there are ways around that, and there are ways to still provide input output as well as interaction. And I'm sure many of you have seen this throughout this webinar series, ways of doing this exact thing. So one way of approaching this then, with all of these underground, these foundations, is to look at the idea of collaborative or cooperative learning. Now in many cases, these two terms are looked at together as synonyms. So cooperative and collaborative learning, the research um, winds up running together. They both are indicative of the same thing, 
But there are some scholars who make a point that there is a difference. And I just want to make sure I point that out um, in case you encounter in your own studies, your own research, things like this. But collaboration then would be the idea that if we put learners together, they work together from the beginning to possibly all the stages until the end product um, in one unit. And that's considered cooperation. So from start to finish, you've got all members working together for that, towards that shared goal. Now that differs a little bit from a collaborative model. And this is where students work or individuals work together toward a shared goal, but they work on their individual paths. And we can think about examples of things like a magazine where you have multiple parties creating content for that magazine, though they don't necessarily work together or collaborate together until that final product is produced. So within a model like this, using those theories we've just talked about, if we set up a group, a community of practice, where we've got a shared goal, where we find a way to make it beneficial to all members so that as we work together, things, um, things work towards that shared goal again. And we often find that when we take this perspective, and we'll talk about this a little more in a few slides, the idea that if we do work in a cooperative, a, a cooperative mode, that a lot of this is um, criterion reference. In other words, we're looking at different tasks and how they're accomplished versus looking at a final score or an average, for example. And it's important to know that this differs very, um, very much so from individualistic or competitive learning. And that's sort of been a dominant mode of education for a number of years where we set up individual goals for students where that means benefits then are for those specific individuals rather than the group at large. And that usually leads us to do things that are norm reference. In other words, we're comparing whatever our students do against um, a specific score or goal or another student, for example. So we, using those theories we talked about today, if we look at them as a whole, they definitely work together within a cooperative environment. And it's one way that we can talk about working with those theories in practice. So Johnson & Johnson um, spent a lot of time in this area. They are talking about how to set up specific um, communities of practice. And they're very clear about the idea that in an ideal community of practice, you have members who are working collaboratively, but they also can compete at times, and they can also work on their own in an individual basis. In their work, in their collaboration of all of these different theories, they find that this balance is, is the ideal foundation. Though they do caution that any type of community of practice should be set up though with cooperation as the foundation, not competition or individualistic learning in order for it to be successful. So let me talk about three types of cooperative learning um, and give you a little more details about how these differ and how these could be implemented then within a classroom um, based on these theories that we've seen today. There are three types, and let me start with formal then. And this one is we have groups working together, usually one class period or, and longer to multiple weeks or to a whole semester. As groups are working together in this manner, they have a joint completion of tasks or assignments, and we see this kind of feels um, right within the social independence theory. And what's important to note is that there's a focus on team building. So rather than it being solely on knowledge or language or content, it's also on developing abilities in our members in that community for how they can work together, especially when things don't go the way they were planned when things go wrong, for example, that we develop those strategies for our kids or our students or our learners so that they're ready to work together towards a common goal. And it's also important to note that within these groups then, if you've got a cooperative learning situation that's formal, you want to work very hard to ensure you have intergroup cooperation. So in other words, group A also has a chance to work with group B and group C, etc. If you don't add this element to this formal cooperative learning, what generally can happen is this turns into an individualistic situation where the groups compete with each other and that defeats the purpose of the shared goal together. All right, so then for the informal, this one differs because we have 
groups, smaller groups that are working together, usually in a temporary type situation, and this usually lasts for a few minutes to possibly an entire class period. But it works very differently from the formal approach in that we're not looking for completion of a specific task or a problem. Instead, we're trying to find agreement on something, a topic, a, a language point, um, something that work, the members have to work together to come to an agreement. And this works very well if we focus on a specific topic or content, for example, possibly a lecture, where you provide information, input, and then allow your learners the chance to work together and figure out what the shared meaning is then from that experience. And it's also used very uh, much so for encouraging understanding the topic or the material or the language point before you move on to the next. Give your, your learners, your members, a chance to work through the process, work through what they just learned before they go on to the next stage. Now from there, we have one more group that is often talked about within Johnson & Johnson's research, and this focuses on a cooperative-based group. And these are very different in makeup um, as well as in how they operate. So these are small groups again, and they're put together for a long term. But they're not there to focus on things like um, content or language. Rather, they're there to help support, encourage, and assist the members of the community as they develop um, their abilities or they learn new things in a particular situation. So again, that focuses on progress and development. And it allows for growth then within that community of practice you've set up, especially if it's working under cooperative or collaborative learning um, using those theories we talked about earlier. So it would be a miss if I did not mention the idea of technology supporting all of this as well. And we've seen with the growth in apps, tools, software, that these things can enhance interaction. And we see this with things like Google Documents, where students, learners can collaborate together in real time or even asynchronously. Um, we see this with tools that now allow flexibility and pace plus location, like we're doing here through Blackboard Collaborate. And one thing we're noticing, and I think maybe, maybe many, many of you have encountered this, is that people today seem to have a, a preference for technology. Not everyone, don't, don't get me wrong, but it seems like many people do kind of gravitate towards technology. There's a little bit less of a fear factor that used to be present. People are often very um, well, ready and willing to look up information, add to information, and that is leading towards it being even more preferable to use this type of cooperative learning through the support of technology. And obviously there are benefits then that come from being able to set things up asynchronously or synchronously. Okay, so let me just wrap up here with some of the challenges that you can probably see from within this method itself. One way of looking at cooperation is to really focus on providing a variety of learners or members within each community of practice or each small group. If you do this, there, the strengths and weaknesses then should be able to balance each other out, though it may lead to problems that develop through things like personality traits, for example, personality differences. And there are some people who say, with cooperative learning, why not let those things happen naturally? Then develop strategies with your students or your learners to ensure that they can move beyond things that are interpersonal problems. Once they surface, you're able to work together, figure out the strategies, and then move forward. Now, I think the biggest concern we have as educators with something like this is the idea of participation. Will every learner be part of the activity, be part of the, the process? And that's a hard one. That, that, there's a lot of research in there that point to different things if you set them up in a certain way that will minimize such um, worries though it is challenging um, for, for learners in general, and even more so virtually. So this idea of um, what's known as social loafing, where one member or two members of the group carries the rest of the group, is definitely a concern for something like this kind of a setup. But even with all of those challenges, and you should never really leave a presentation with a negative, um, there are plenty of positive things that we've seen through the use of cooperative or collaborative learning. Um, and they really do fit into those foundations that we talked about earlier, those theoretical backgrounds. Um, so let me wrap up here. I don't want to go over time, 
Um, but you, we do see when people use these, based on a lot of these theories we talked about, that there is greater effort exerted to achieve goals if you're working together towards a common goal. There's often a higher quality of peer relations, and you learn things that I don't think we normally learn in an individualistic or competitive mode. And then for a lot of people, there's a, a great deal of adjustment. The people learn how to work in teams, work, work together, and that um, fits very well into that social interdependence theory. Okay, having said that, let me wrap up with thanking you for allowing me to come today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or concerns. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Dustin. That was awesome. And I learned a new term that I'm going to say all the time now, social loafing. Um, are there any questions from any of us? Roman had a question. What if some students do not like the idea of shared goals? Oh, of course, it would be a difficult question. Yeah, and there's plenty of students that don't, especially when it comes through virtual learning or at a distance. It becomes even more challenging. Um, in my own experience, what I've done often is, uh, in cases like that, there, there are ways of structuring a course or a lesson where there are chances for individual work. And in, in extreme cases, um, I, I've had to do things where it's that individual is able to then work on, on a goal that's not shared, um, just because you do have to cons take into consideration the learners, every learner in your room, and if one person is going beyond social loafing and really causing a problem, it influences the, the outcomes then for all of your students. So in some cases, I, I have had to do things um, with an individual basis, and it does change the dynamics in the group. It's a little bit easier to do at a distance because you do have some space, some uh, distance from each other, so to speak, um, but in the face-to-face, -face, it's a little bit more challenging since you do have people in the same room. I have a question. Um, so my students work on like, pair, pair work projects together, or not projects, but assignments, and um, usually I let them choose their own partner um, because sometimes I'll have students that are going to the same school and they can work together at school. Um, but more often than not, I usually have a student that will, for some reason, you know, just come to me and be like, oh, I can't find a partner. Um, and so I, I really struggle with those ones because I feel like I have to give them an option in order to complete the assignment. Um, and, but I still, they still need to complete, um, this, like, you know, collaborative task with another student rather than just me giving them an alternative. Um, so I guess, what are your thoughts on that type of situation? That is a challenging situation for sure. And it's a little bit of a balancing act. And there, in some of the research for cooperative learning then, People are very vocal about part of the process of collaborative learning is that individuals have to learn how to work together as a group. So in cases where you find students who work with the same student, the same pair at every turn, that is a little bit of a challenge then for the main ideas on, with the idea that if they're cooperating but they're not learning new skills, team building skills, because they're with the same person every time, it, it doesn't lead to the same positive outcomes that other situations would. But it is really challenging when there's one learner who just does not connect or have either the background or the necessary skills to try to make connections with others in a classroom. Um, I, I myself am a little bit hesitant about forcing people to work together. I think there are very few cases, really, even in the workplace, where you're forced to work with someone. So I do, myself, find myself offering multiple options. Possibly a pair might turn into a group of three, maybe where they can work together. Um, maybe there's a really strong uh, team builder in that group of three who could then possibly pass on some skills to the 
the other individuals. Um, that's really a, a challenging case, though. Have you tried other ways of grouping your students together? Um, so one semester I tried pairing them based on, like, who is the most, like, active in the class versus, like, who wasn't logging in or completing any work. Um, and that was still pretty challenging, mostly because they all log on at, like, really different times. Um, and my students are just, they're, like, always surprised that they have to do assignments with a partner. They're like, oh, this is an online class. I don't have to work with anybody. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's always like, what? I have to do this? Um, and I try to be upfront with them about the expectations for the class. But, you know, there's always going to be, like, students that are just not going to do it, I think. Um, so. No, I, I definitely agree, Bridget, and that's one of those ideas that I don't think is fully, people fully realize with online learning that, yes, you do have to work with other people. It's not just that you're you're there, um, and I, I don't think we do a very good job, especially earlier on with online learning. I think it was very individualistic, and a lot of people took that model and, and ran with it for years, mostly because technology didn't support a lot of other avenues. And we're getting to the point where, yes, yeah, somebody put it here, Stephen put, uh, yeah, the online and alone is very close. And that's uh, um, that's a problem. And I, and I think a lot of people, I, I myself struggle with this, with, with really getting to the student-to-student -student interactions in an online environment, how to make those successful. Um, and I, I wish I had a magic answer for you, but that one is still something I'm learning myself. Thanks. That was a great response. I really appreciate it. And at least I'm not the only one struggling. <laughs> no, Are definitely. There... And I hear many people talk about that same struggle um, as we're pushing farther and farther online and more classes keep appearing there. Definitely. Are there any other questions or does anybody have anything else they'd like to add to the discussion or shall we move on? Herman had a great comment. Students that struggle socially can really excel in online environments. Yeah, I totally agree with that, Herman. I have a lot of students who have, um, you know, they're a little bit awkward, um, but they really, really enjoy being in the online class. It's like a really nice little community for them, especially because they all love Japan and Japanese and anime. So it's, it's a nice little gathering place for them. Go ahead, Roman. Um, yes, Bridget. Um, sorry, there's some problem. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say that uh, a lot of the times when uh, when there is a group assignment in the class, like an online class, the responsibility all of the members get the same grade, so that creates a problem because, uh, uh, like Dustin said, you know, if one of the members actually doesn't contribute then the rest of them, they feel like they have to complete the assignment without without that person just to get the grade going. So that I feel like that's one of the problems that needs to be addressed usually by, by the instructor. Great point. Yeah, I usually um, grade my students individually whenever they do care work. Um, you know, your student A, and B, you take turns. So um, it is hard to crack down on social loafing online. 